Hey, everybody, what's going on? Welcome to the GMI Rocket Show. Uh, I am your host, Roman Zelichenko. I am a former immigration lawyer and now the founder and CEO of Laborless, which is an immigration tech platform that automates H-1B visa compliance, and also the founder of GMI Rocket, which brings you this show. Um, today, I'm really excited for our guest, Casey Myers, who is the founder of One Digital World. Um, and so One Digital World actually provides upskilling and education and um, teaches uh, folks at refugee camps uh, things that would help them kind of reestablish themselves in society and you know, get a job and, and kind of um, get back on track in terms of their life. And uh, it's, it's, it's inspiring uh, to say the least, but I think it's also really cool because it shows uh, people that, you know, helping refugees is not just, you know, donating money to a nonprofit. And then, go, you know, there's, there's so much that we can do to provide help and to support uh, individuals in need with uh, the resources that we have and utilizing technology for that is a really great uh, way to do that. So um, there's so much to talk about, uh, but of course I can't do it alone. So without further ado, Casey, thank you so much for, for being here and for joining. Um, and I'm just really excited to hear your story. And then of course the story of everything you've been doing with One Digital World. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to be here today and chatting with you. So you, uh, you're in San Diego, right? I am. And are you from there? You're from California originally? I'm actually from Washington, D.C. originally, the D.C. area, Northern Virginia area. Oh, wow. I, when I was a lawyer, I, was, I lived in uh, Arlington, and I worked in Arlington. So that's uh, like... <laughs> I'm from Fairfax County. For <laughs> oh, nice. Born yeah, and raised, I, yeah. That's so crazy. So you went from East Coast to West Coast. Yeah, when I finished high school, California was like, that was the other side of the planet to me at the time. You know, that was as far. I was ready to, to spread my wings and go off and be an adult at, you know, 17. <laughs> I'm actually really jealous because I've always wanted to move to California, but I feel like I've always been too much of a scaredy cat. Um, I don't know. I just feel like being so far away from where I'm sort of from, if you will, uh, has just scared me. But I love California. There's so much to do. It's beautiful. The mountains, the beaches, the food. It is, it is stunning. And California has a really good job of like when people come out to visit, then they never leave. So <laughs> if you're afraid of ending up here, don't even visit because you'll never want to go back. <laughs> I also heard San Diego had one of the most, the biggest increases of real estate over the past year, which is kind of crazy. I guess a lot of people. Oh, in value. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. So, okay. So, but to back up a little bit, um, so, so you grew up in the DC area. Um, and you, you, you stayed there the whole time. So throughout your younger years, throughout sort of high school, et cetera. Yeah, uh, how, I was one of those weirdos that wasn't from a military family. So everybody else was moving in and out, but I just stayed there. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it, so you grew up in a place with a lot, in a neighborhood with a lot of military families? Yes, very much. Okay. Um, and so did, did that mean that kind of friends came in and out of your life type of thing? Or were there people who were also from there who were kind of there the whole time? There's a few smaller, but most for the most part, it was like a whole new friends every three years. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Was that challenging? Like, well, I don't know. What was it? What was that like for you? Um, I mean, I think it probably made me really resilient and adaptable. As though you know, I had moved to places, but I was so used to like making new friends and introducing myself over again and hearing cool stories about all these interesting places. Like, lots of people had. Um, my best friend even had grown up in Germany and a lot of them had lived, you know, overseas in different bases and things like that. So it seemed, I think the whole world kind of in that respect seemed a lot closer and a lot more normal to me because most people yeah. I knew had lived somewhere else or at least been there. That's so cool. Yeah. It's like the world descended onto you rather than you having to necessarily travel the, the world, which, which you did eventually. And we'll, we will get to that. Um, so, and when you, and when you were younger, I've, I've kind of like started to ask this uh, to, to guests on the show. Do you feel that you had any sort of entrepreneurial or business tendencies when you were younger? Like, were you the kind of lemonade selling child or, or baseball card trading child or something like that? Um, I don't know if I was an entrepreneur. I did volunteer a lot as a child. Uh, and so I was, and I was, I did all of the sports, all the activities I was definitely the one my parents and my siblings I was one my parents were always like carting around to every single one of my events I would like 
cry because I they would only let me choose like three per like school semester activities that I could be in. So I was definitely a busybody and always did lots of like volunteering and things like that too. I always found that I'm, really interesting and fun. I, I'm curious because I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this, but the first time I quote unquote volunteered was probably in in college or something, maybe in, maybe in late high school, but I just feel like it was never, I never thought about, I don't know, maybe it wasn't part of my sort of family dynamic when we were younger. I mean, we came here as immigrants. We came here actually as refugees from the former Soviet Union. So I guess it was like head down work and like get settle, right. And get things done. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, but I, when I see kids, usually I guess it's your parents, I suppose, pushing you. Is that sort of what happened? Or I don't know, did you come across something where you said, you just said, I want to help? Like, how did that come about for you where you were volunteering as a child or a younger person? Yeah, I mean, yeah, even actually as a child, I think um, it kind of randomly, my parents, my, uh, my mom worked in the hospital. So we always did do things like associate with the hospital of, um, you know, they would do events where we were always for Christmas picking out a uh, Christmas gift for a different child that was our age. We'd like, you know, like adopt a family and get, and so we'd get to go and pick out what they were going to get for Christmas based on their lists. And then uh, I think from my friends, uh, I remember, I think I was in like fifth grade maybe, um, but one of my very best friends, uh, I've, she goes to church. My family was not didn't actively practice any religion, but she went to church and they were doing for spring break, like a kind of camp. You could, you slept at the church and then every day they got to go to a different place and do a different volunteer activity. I was like, what? I get to go sleep in a building you don't usually sleep in? That was the hook for me and um, sounded really interesting. And we got to go, we went down into downtown DC and would go and, you know, hand out like, jackets and things like that. I, I guess it was spring, so it was still cold and go uh, into like soup kitchens and help serve there. And my parents were involved. My, uh, my grandfather was in a nursing home. And so we would go and like sing in the nursing home as children. So I think there was kind of lots of random, none of them were particularly tied together, but lots of random activities. Um, and for me, I just always love like going and trying and doing new things and being really active. So I think whenever those kinds of activities or opportunities arose, no matter where it was, I always wanted to go and be a part of it. I think what's really cool about that too is clearly you weren't shy of, you know, in front of new people, I guess. And, and you were sort of just willing to put yourself out there in a new situation. I do get the appeal as a child of being like, I can sleep somewhere else besides my house, like so cool. Um, but, but, but even still, you know, like that's fun. But then the next day you have to go to some new neighborhood and, you know, talk to strangers, give out jackets or whatever it might be. Um, I can imagine a lot of kids, probably myself too. I was really shy when I was a kid, uh, being kind of nervous about that. Right. Which of course means that you might not have had those, those opportunities. So I'm just imagining little you kind of running around like really energetic and enthusiastic. And, and I don't know, whenever I see kids like that, it's really kind of inspiring. And you're like, that person's going to do something something with their life. Um, yeah, yeah, I was pretty outgoing. And I actually, when I was uh, very young and then all the way through high school too, uh, I did theater, which I've I've heard on some of your casts and some of your previous work too, that you're into theater. I think that that also played into that, you know? You don't always have to feel like you're putting yourself out there. <laughs> yeah, it's like you go through the motions of being on stage, but as someone else, so it's not as exposing, right? Right, you're not quite so vulnerable. You know, it's funny. I. I wish I did theater when I was a kid because I really fell in love with it. I started in law school, um, but I just was so shy and nervous before then. I would never have done it. So I guess it took me a little while to get into my own, but it's such a it's such a powerful medium and it really teaches you so much that can completely translate to like professional life. It doesn't have to just be, you know, you don't have to be an actor if you're going to be, if you can go into theater, you could be literally anything, a doctor, a lawyer, a founder, or anything, um, and, and it can help you. I think one of the biggest skills I learned from it too, you know, it's, they tell you all the time in theater, like no one else knows your words. No one else knows the script. So if you forget, fake it and just keep going. And I thought translating to so different things in life. You're like, you might not always have all of the answer, but act like you figure it out and then eventually you'll get right back on track. 
That's right. And when you're when you know the script, you know what's coming next. Like you know that next step. And so all you have to do if you forgot, you know, you're not going to forget the whole script. You might forget a few words. You just bridge the gap to, you know, the next thing that you know. Yeah, there's so much. Maybe maybe this maybe this warrants its own separate discussion. How theater <laughs> is uh, you know beneficial to uh, professionals, especially in the immigration industry. Um, before we do move on, I want to mention. So we got got a couple comments coming in. I do want to say to people, anyone who's watching live, uh, let us know where you're watching from. So right now we're a bi-coastal conversation. I know there's people probably hopefully watching from different parts of the country, perhaps the world. So, you know, say hello. Let us drop a note, drop a comment, say where you're where you're um, watching from. Uh, we've got Heather from DC MDVA uh, came back to Fairfax from Seattle. So Heather has done the opposite coast to coast commute. Um, so thank you for for watching, uh, Heather. Uh, Andrew Wilson saying, my favorite part of the series is seeing so many people better than me doing great work that changes people's lives. That's really nice. Casey's commitment to this cause is hugely impressive. That's awesome. And, well, Andrew, stay tuned. I'm really excited to get into everything that, um, Casey, that you're doing. And Marianne says, uh, oh, I guess there's a comment here maybe that we don't see. Totally amazing learning about all the great things happening in the space. Um, and she also says, no one will know when you're improvising. That's the best part. That's why. That's why I love improv because there are no uh there's no um there's no script so you can't mess up like the whole idea of a show is you just you mess up successfully for 30 minutes um and marianne is actually a dc migrant to the west coast that's interesting dc to san france you, you you two are basically quite the same um steven from salt lake city steven thank you for watching as always appreciate you being here and then heather uh, is okay. You're in New Jersey from, from uh, Fairfax. So awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Keep coming in. You know, I love to kind of pop up people's comments and, you know, make this a con That's why I love doing this live. Otherwise we just record, you know, on zoom and put it out there, but that's why this is fun live. So, um, okay, cool. So you, you, you know, you were kind of this outgoing volunteering adventurous kid. Um, I, I suspect you were doing the same thing. You know, you're kind of the same in, in high school, um, and then when you graduated high school, you were like, I'm going out to California. Uh, now, did you, did you go out to attend college in California? Were you first like, let me just explore. Okay. So you, you went to college, uh, right away. Um, what were your kind of goals and plans then? Right. Cause it's, it's not like you went to a college that's close by and then you're going to maybe move to the city and get a job in an accounting firm. It sounds like you had sort of maybe a different vision for yourself or maybe, didn't have anything concrete and were like, this would be a really great place to explore. So I'm kind of curious of like what was going on in your head at that time. Cause you're clearly driven, right? You're doing things, you know, actively as a person. So what were you thinking about back then in terms of maybe your, your career, your life, your studies? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I didn't think that I, I had what it took to actually become like a famous actress. So <laughs> I tried to be a bit more realistic when I applied to college. Um, and I, I've always really loved math, actually. And so um, in high school, I had a teacher that was really, uh, really had a big impact on me. And she used to allow me to take the homework a day before. And then if I did everything right, she'd let me teach the lesson in class the next day. And uh, so that felt really cool. And so, <laughs> um, so I thought I wanted to be a math teacher. So I actually went to San Francisco State University um, as a math major, uh, but I'd never been to California. And uh, so, you know, I applied to a couple of schools, the only cities I'd heard of, San Francisco, San Diego, and Long Beach because of I'm a big Sublime fan and <laughs> Snoop. So the Long Beach crew, I thought, well, I'll just join them. I love uh, it. Yeah, and I ended up in San Francisco as a math major, not realizing that that college was really uh, much more of a commuter college. So not not what I anticipated as the sunny, sunshine, sandy shores of California that I had seen on TV. So uh, I only stayed there for two years and then I transferred uh, down to San Diego. And then I started wearing flip-flops and surfing and it felt right. <laughs> and so did you end up, you end up graduating and getting your degree in mathematics? I actually ended up switching. I switched a few times my major. I, I like too many things. I think that's my problem sometimes. I like too many things. I think everything is interesting. So I, um, I actually finished my degree with a bachelor's in psychology with minors in mathematics and social work. Wow. 
Okay. Um, that's very cool. Cause it's like a human, there's a human element there and there's like a purely analytical, like totally abstract element there. Um, that's really, that's really fascinating. And also just a shout out to all of our teachers out there, because this is one of those stories where like, you don't even realize how you can have an impact on someone years, uh, years down the road in their life. Um, but I, I love that. Like, I love hearing stories of people who like 20, 30, 40, 70 years later, remember, do you remember this teacher's name? I don't remember her name, but I do know my fourth grade teacher was Miss Chris, and she also absolutely changed my life. Yeah. Well, that's and and that just you know that's sort of the that's sort of the kind of the lesson always for me for teachers. Um, also, sorry, but I'm curious when you were when you were teaching these students their their math, were they ever like, did they was it cool? Like, was that cool, or did, did they ever kind of not make fun of you, but they, were they like, oh, this like Casey again, like? <laughs> show off i don't know i'm just curious how that kind of went no i mean it actually was i don't think anybody else really cared like some people thought it was kind of cool and everybody else didn't really care they're like okay. whatever i like i don't know i don't even like math so whoever teaches it it's fine <laughs> that's actually the best option because you love it and you're having great experience and then they just they don't care they're just in there yes. um that that's super cool so okay so you graduated with a degree in um in psychology and then you had these these minors uh, or, or sort of other concentrations, uh, and and then, you, but you didn't. It's not like you end up going into this sort of world of kind of working with refugees or immigration or anything like that. You had a couple of other jobs. Um, so I was curious about a little bit of that because I know you ended up at working in higher ed for some time, um, and then you of course went on this like world trip. Um, but then, at, at, but as you were your early your early jobs, um, I don't know. Again, like, what were you thinking? What were you kind of working towards? Or were you also just like, I'm in the beach right now. I'm wearing flip-flops. Let me just work and just enjoy this for some time without going from school to a 50-hour-a-week job where I don't even get to live. Yeah. Um, I mean, kind of both, I guess. I, I think there's certainly different stages. You know, you go through some times in your life where, like, a couple of years of really – personal life development versus years of really professional life development. And I've definitely had stages of that. Uh, so yeah, I was, when I was working for in higher education, um, I, I, I hadn't anticipated working there, but I, I got a job offer there and it paid significantly more than uh, what I was at before. I will try this and really, uh, and I really, I really enjoyed that. And I, I was there for, for a number of years. Um, and it's actually where I met so many of my very best friends. I'm I'm actually getting married in two months and half my bridal party is people that my coworkers from there. Like we just, uh, just really, really bonded. And in doing that, we, uh, one of the things that we bonded out with was running. So we actually got into long distance running together and uh, eventually flew out to Europe to go run a marathon together. And so we started doing more and more trips and kind of started taking these vacations and traveling to different places around the world. And is, is that kind of how you got into, like, did you travel a lot before then? Cause I know, you know, you, you eventually, I guess, left your job and to do kind of a solo, I guess, backpacking trip, um, but this, was happening beforehand. This is while you were still working. You were kind of just two weeks here and then back and then a week there and then back. So did that sort of give you an interest of like, wow, I really need to go out and see the world? It absolutely did. Yeah. I had, I had not traveled internationally um, mm. really much at all before that and hadn't really thought of it as a possibility. And it, it kind of just opened these doors and opened this horizon. And uh, as we started doing it more and more and going to different countries, I just, thought this really isn't that hard. Like I fly on an airplane to go home. I can, for the same amount of time and often the same price or cheaper, I can fly to Costa Rica. <laughs> like I can fly to these other really amazing places. And I, uh, and it, it made me see the world in a different, different light. And it just, it made it so much smaller. Everything's so, so much more accessible. So, so can you talk, can you talk a little bit about this moment where you said, all right, I'm going to leave my job and actually go on this 
kind of was it a solo trip? Did you did you go solo? No, I actually went. Um, I went on the trip with uh, three of my coworkers. We all we all decided to. We had a girls' night. We had some wine, played some Uno, and uh, decided to quit our jobs and travel the world together. <laughs> wow! And and you all did. You and all we did. We it. gave ourselves six months to like save up money and take get our affairs over and. Uh, we took off and we bought a one-way ticket and we figured we'll figure it out as we go along. Wow. And uh, we didn't stay together the whole time. We'd be able to go off and kind of do our own solo trips um, from there as well. But yeah, we're, we're all, we, we were all working for the same company and I loved what I did and I really believe in education. And I know that like knowledge really is power. It opens up so many doors uh, and it's just, it's a foundation, you know, once you change into a growth mindset and realize that you can continue to learn whether it is formal and structured or whether it is informal and just learning how to do things like research on the internet so you can learn about whatever new type of topics and teach yourself, like that is transformative. And I knew that I wanted to do that, but I, I wasn't, I had was ready for a change because the where I was at and the organization I was working with, what I was doing, it wasn't quite it. And and I knew from doing these trips, I was really interested in kind of seeing how they did it in other places. Hmm. What is what's the education system like in other places? What are they learning? Why? What's working? What's not? Being from DC, I've always had a little bit of a political background as well. So I found that fascinating. And uh yeah, we just we ended up spending uh, four and a half months in South America, two months in Europe, two months in Africa, two months in Asia, a month in Australia, and a month in New Zealand. And I would say of that first year of uh, travels, I probably spent about two to three months of it doing solo travel. So we'd kind of be back and forth together. Where was the first country that you landed? Belize. Oh, nice. Start, start off, starting off fancy on the beach. We did. We did. We actually had, I think there was like 10 of us. So we had a bunch of our friends like come out and we kind of did like a kickoff out in Belize. That's and really then, cool. Yeah, it was beautiful to go back. <laughs> the moment where half of them are going back to their jobs and the rest of you are like, all right, we're off to the rest of the, uh, to see yeah. more of Central and South America it must have been really fun. Um, that, yeah. That's, that's super cool. And like, you know, telling the story, it kind of, it, it's clear that education is a thread throughout your life, right? Like you, you loved, you had this knack for mathematics and your teacher let you teach math to young kids in school. Um, you love that. You wanted to be a math teacher and maybe you didn't end up doing it, but this desire to impart information on people stayed with you. You ended up working in higher ed where you really enjoyed that kind of work and saw the power of it. And then of course there's this like concept of like, let me see how that also works in other countries. So it's very cool to see this thread of sort of education um, permeate your sort of your life from, from early kind of from childhood, um, if you will. So, so you traveled all over, I mean, traveled multiple continents, sometimes solo, sometimes with friends. Um, I mean, I'm sure you can talk for days and weeks about all the different adventures you had. Um, I'm curious, you know, because, you eventually, I think, as far as I understand, you ended up staying, you didn't come back after that, or maybe you did for a little bit of time, but you, you ended up going into Greece and staying there and working at a refugee camp. I'm curious, before we get to that moment, sort of, do you feel that during that year, you transformed at all as a person? I mean, I'm sure, you know, travel changes all of us, whether it's for two weeks or obviously for a year, but I guess I'm curious if that happened to you, and if so, kind of what are some of the things that you remember, maybe some profound experiences that really perhaps shaped you and made that year worth it uh, for you in terms of your your goals or your thoughts on life or whatever? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think we knew, of course, how can you spend a year traveling around the world to foreign countries and, and not be changed, but we didn't really anticipate a lot of, of what did end up happening. Um, I think one of the, the most impactful uh, moments for me actually was, was pretty early on. We, uh, it was in, only in our second country uh, that we went to. It was about three weeks. 
into our 12 month voyage. Um, we were in Brazil and I got sick, I got really, really sick. And we really didn't know why. Um, and I was, you know, I, I've saved up, I'm going on my life savings here to go on this trip, right? So we're kind of being like, we're like, okay, this is our budget, like per day. And that's going to include like our flights, and our visas and everything. So we're our super tight budget, especially in the beginning, because you don't know what's going to end up happening throughout the year. So I'm being, um, being a little, little, little stingy with my buddy, trying to be very protective and stay on budget. Um, and so I, uh, I can be a little, you know, a tough guy when it comes to my health. And so I started feeling sick and I was like, oh, I need a hot shower. I just take a hot shower and I'll feel all better. And then I was like, hmm, that didn't do it. So I was like, oh, I'll have like a bowl of hot soup. Just steam it right out. I didn't. Um, and uh, I, I ended up in and out of a clinic for a week in a like rural part of Brazil. Um, and like, my skin started turning yellow and my fingers were purple and I started fainting. I was vomiting. I was, I started like having trouble walking. I couldn't really use my right leg. Um, and it, yeah, things went downhill pretty quickly and I couldn't shake it off as much as I kept trying to. Uh, and fortunately my, and we were doing, we were doing a travel blog. So we're updating people like, oh, these are all the cool things we saw. Like, these are the cool facts we're learning. And so I was like, oh, well, we should update people on what's going on with me because, no, this is taking a while. Uh, and so I started getting messages from people. One of my very best friends uh, who was engaged to a doctor and she messaged, she's like, you need to go to a hospital immediately. Like, this is not right. And um, I... I ended up um, coming back to the hostel and my friends that I was there with, as well as the hostel owner and his wife and her parents were all sitting down in the doorway and my mom was on FaceTime and my friend Liz was on FaceTime and they were like, so we've all decided that we're taking you. We found a really nice hospital. It's the best hospital in Brazil. It's in Sao Paulo. It's about half an hour away. There's a van waiting outside. We've packed your bag. Jenna's going with you and here you go. I was like, oh. All right, so we ended up going down to the hospital and they made me promise that I would stay until the doctor said that I was cleared to go because I kept checking myself out. And, um, and thank goodness that they did because um, that, that night I actually lost the ability to breathe. So my, my organs had started failing, my lungs filled up with fluid and I, was, uh, I became septic. Wow. And and we had just no idea what's going on. Of course, my family is back home. And um, we ended up finding out later, uh, good news, I survived. <laughs> we ended up finding out later that I uh, had contracted MRSA, um, which is super common. It's just as common here in the US as anywhere else. So just like a really freak thing, I was running, we were running in the rain and I slipped and I bumped my knee and I think I must have like scratched my knee and somehow um, got MRSA in there. I ended up being in the intensive care unit for three weeks and I had to do physical therapy to like retrain my lungs, how to breathe. Um, my legs had atrophied. So I, I had to do physical therapy to start walking again. Uh, and this is a three weeks into my trip. So I was like, I don't want to go. Like I just was so, uh, so refused, wanted to refuse that I was so sick. And um, my, uh, my, my mom like worked, fortunately my former employer, they like still honored my health insurance because it hadn't been a month since I'd left my job. Mm -hmm. And I had travel insurance, always get travel insurance. Yes. And so they sent out a travel nurse and they medevaced me um, back to the US to do uh, physical therapy. After three weeks in the hospital there, I came back, did physical therapy in the US for two weeks. They said, you have to do it for two weeks. And um, my friends put up a uh, GoFundMe to help raise money for me to come back out and travel. And we raised it in like two days. It was crazy. And so I bought the ticket and I left on the 13th day, I actually hit my 14th day 
a physical therapy while I was on flight and I met back up with them uh, in Mendoza, Argentina and continued the rest of the trip. And only two weeks later, we actually hiked Machu Picchu <laughs> in Peru. That's so wild. Wow. <laughs> I, I feel like, were your parents like, please don't go back? You know, I, I, I think everyone else's parents thought that for me. <laughs> and, but my parents have always been just like so supportive. They're so amazing. My mom, is, I'm particularly, um, my parents are separated. So I'm particularly close with my mom and she was helping me through all of this. And she was just like, everyone else would tell her like, how are you gonna let her go back? And she'd be like, she's Casey. She's gonna do what she's gonna do. Yeah. She's, you know, she, like just gotta support her and, and I'd appreciate that so much. And. Um, yeah, so she didn't, she, I, I fully expected that she'd, I'd get the guilt trip. I think, well, that's why I was afraid to go home with the nurse, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, no, she's really supportive. She's probably been the most supportive, even of me doing the trip in the first place, you know, quitting, quitting my job and like six figure income to go backpack around it for a year. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, very lucky in that way. So that was amazing. And, and in that moment, like being in the hospital there and uh, we had, before we went, we actually canceled our phone plans, you know, told you budget cuts. So we only had a uh, phone service when we were somewhere that had Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the hospitals that I was going to, the clinics I was going to did not have Wi-Fi. And so I could not use Google translate, which also is not good in 2016. And uh, so I couldn't even communicate. So like, you know, I'm there, I'm like really gross and sick. And, uh, and I'm like having to act this out <laughs> to doctors because I don't speak Portuguese. And Portuguese and Spanish are really not, not like as people like to say. <laughs> so, you know, just really being, I mean, it was, for me, it was just such a learning experience because I've never, I've never been vulnerable like that. And I was just completely, I mean, there was a point, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't even breathe on my own. I couldn't do anything. And I very much like to go and, you know, take care of things and fix problems. And I like, I'm so much more of like a caretaker for other people. So it can be, it was really a struggle for me to be able to accept this and from people that I couldn't even talk to and just accept like these strangers and like hope that they're just going to take care of me and, and, and make me better and I'm so far away. And uh, it was, and I was really so moved because we had been doing that travel blog, seeing how many people online that were so supportive. I think I had two people that were like friends of friends of a cousin of somebody else's friend, just like third grade school neighbor that like came to the hospital that I was in in Brazil and like brought me food and said like, they were bringing me like well wishes. I was like, wow, this is wild. And like people's like, were telling me that like their churches were praying for me. I mean, just there were so many people that were just sending me so much love and you know, whatever way that they felt that like just getting good vibes or energy or prayers or whatever you wanna call it. And I, people, so many people that I just didn't even know and, uh, and feeling so like, like, thank you. I don't usually need this stuff, but I do right now. Mm -hmm. And it, and it made so much of a difference because it was, it was definitely hard and I felt very isolated. Was time. it actually scary for you? Were you, or were you just thinking like, yeah, I'll just get through this eventually. Cause I imagine somebody, you know, if, if you're the kind of person who's like, yeah, I'll just take a hot shower or I'll <laughs> eat a bowl of soup with a couple of spices, you know, and sweat it out. I would imagine I'm kind of like that too. And I feel like, okay, even if I'm feeling crappy, I wouldn't give up. It's like, yeah, I'll be fine eventually. I just have to get through it. But did you feel, was it like scary to be, I mean, all of these things you are in a new country. You're not able to connect with people easily. Um, you know, you can't speak the language. You're feeling probably worse than you'd ever felt in your life physically. Um, was it, was that actually scary for you? I mean, I think it took a while for it to get scary for me right. because I was in denial. I right. was in denial for, for, thank goodness for them. Like looking back now, I can be like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. But, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I was, I was really in denial. Even when I was in the hospital, even when I was like on breathing, uh, tubes for a while, I was like, oh, but 
it's not my, they actually contacted my mom and they told her that the speed that my, my body was going into failure, my organs were failing, that um, I had about 48 hours and that she needed to get an emergency visa and come down uh, wow. to Brazil because they didn't know, they still didn't know what was wrong with me. So they didn't know how to fix it. They're like, we're trying everything, you know? It's like, a, like an episode of House. Like, what is this mystery that's going on with this girl that from a foreign land that doesn't speak our language? Like, <laughs> and um, and and uh, politic being from DC, we know a lot of people that work at the embassies too. So we thought for sure, at least I'm in a really good position for that. We know people that help get these uh, visas. She still couldn't get it. Wow, she just didn't get it. So I knew that that. You know, on her side, she was like, just kept busy with trying to deal with insurance. <laughs> Damn. Which that, could air, so. your, your poor mother in that moment. I can't even imagine. Um, <laughs> and obviously, thank goodness you're, you you made it out fine. But wow, what an experience. And, and, and then, so, and you can't, like the fact that you came back and you just continued traveling, um, I, I suppose it probably gave you a new perspective on like, A, self-care, I guess, while traveling, really important. Um, yeah. Uh, but then B, and I really like the point you made of like accepting care from others and like even despite being somebody who maybe typically is the one who wants to help people and but doesn't quote unquote maybe need help from others, like to be able to then accept help. Because I actually find that traveling, I mean, we can have a whole conversation about traveling, but when you're traveling, you kind of, you do need help from people. Just like when you're in New York or wherever and people come up to you from another country and they're like, oh, how do I get here? I'll always help them. I love helping. Oh, it's that station or you're on the wrong platform. You have to go to that one. And they, you know, they go on their merry way. And, and I, I like that. But when I'm that person, I, God forbid, I ask somebody for help. Um, <laughs> that That's so, that's so crazy. Uh, and, and so, so how did you then turn that sort of, this entire travel experience into working at a, a refugee camp um, because you worked there for a year and a half. Right. And you can't just like, I mean, you can't just work on a tourist visa for a year and a half. So maybe, maybe if it's a volunteer, I, I guess I'm not hundred percent sure, but how did that happen where you came across that and you thought, a, I I want to do this. And then B, how did it actually happen? Yeah, we have. Um, so part of the time that's, the supper actually was when we were in Europe. And so I uh, started using to get around. They have a an app there called Blah Blah Car. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's kind of like Uber, except in Europe, Europe countries are like states in the US, right? It's open borders once you're within uh, the confines of the Schengen zone. Uh, and so uh, they have blah, blah car, which can be, you know, you start in Croatia and you're hitching a ride with somebody to go up to Germany. Right. And so I used blah, blah car, like really affordable and what a great way to be able to talk and meet locals. Uh, and I'm, and at this point I was traveling by myself. So I, I loved it. Just chit chat. You're just road trip with somebody. And, uh, and so I remember I was in a blah, blah car. Actually, the example I gave you is the place that I went. I, I think I got in from Croatia and we were going up to Germany. And um, there was a, a gigantic Hungarian guy in the seat next to me. Um, in this time, we're in like a Fiat for like 18 hours. <laughs> uh, he couldn't, I remember because he couldn't even put his knees, he couldn't even put his legs down because the chair was too close. <laughs> I was like, you're going to sit like that for 18 hours. So he like sat like sideways and I was like, I'm tiny. I'll pretzel up. Like, yeah. I don't mind. Uh, and so we're, we're heading up there and it was um, a couple and then they had their, their child also. So the five of us in this tiny little car, little clown car, and we're talking and they tell me that just the day before uh, they had been over in Italy and they had picked someone up and someone got in the car and they said, oh, I just, just arrived uh, from Sudan. He had literally was a refugee and he had taken a boat across the Mediterranean, gotten off this dinghy in Italy called blah, blah car and was having a kick to his brother in another country in Italy, in Europe. And I thought, 
excuse me, what? And he'd like just, he'd like left like two days before had seen like war. And so um, I, I was, I had no idea. And I, you know, I had a million questions like how, how interesting, like what, what did he say? Where is he going? Why is he going? What's, you know, what's going on? And it was, yeah, really, really very fascinated. Uh, he was like still wet when he got in the car. And, um, and so uh, as I, as I uh, continued traveling, I kind of started hearing because this was when the, uh, the, we started, Europe started to see a large influx from Syria and particularly the Middle East, still also getting some refugees from Africa, but the, they called it the European refugee crisis. They start, really started seeing a huge influx of people coming in. And so it wasn't really on the news yet, but I'm starting to hear these rumors and little stories here and there from different people. And I thought that's so fascinating. Like what's, why is this not being covered? Really what's, what's going on? And I just kind of was soaking it up like a sponge. And uh, I went to, I went to Asia next and I was in uh, Cambodia and I went to uh, the killing fields. And I also uh, was really unfamiliar before that about the Cambodian genocide and, and um, finally touched. Um, in that experience, learning that and how can something so atrocious happen in such a short period of time? I mean, they lost a third of their country in three years and like people didn't even know yet. <laughs> Wild. Um, and so we had about two months uh, and at that time I actually also got a book and it was an autobiography written by a survivor of the Cambodian genocide who then he survived by fleeing to Thailand and then eventually was resettled to Los Angeles. And he actually was in a movie about the killing fields and won like an Oscar for it. He wasn't the lead character, but he was in it, like won an Oscar for it. Really, really, really very interesting guy. And just tells really the details of like, how does this happen? And what kind of journey did he have to go through and what kind of decisions did he have to make in order to just to have a regular, just to get to the point of having a regular life. And um, so when I, by the time we got to our last country was Australia and we did like a month long road trip there. I was like, what are we gonna do after this? You know, none of us had any plans. In order to go on this trip, we'd all sold all of our stuff and like only kept what we could fit in a backpack. So I'm like, I don't really have any ties anywhere. Um, and I thought, I, I wanna know if this is still going on, I don't know what you do in a refugee camp, but I have, you know, managed a staff of 90 for a multi-million dollar company. Uh, and I also know how to pick up garbage and clean toilets. So I don't know what you do there, but I figure at this rate, I can do anything for a month. So uh, we, we finished our trip. I went back to, to San Diego uh, for two weeks and I, as I was apt to do, bought a one-way ticket. I literally just Googled European refugee crisis and found that really it was like all centered on this one tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean called Lesbos. And so I bought, I, I looked up and I Googled uh, what, what nonprofits are there at this camp? What is this camp called? And I found a Dutch organization and I contacted them, said, hey, I'd really love to come out and volunteer. Would that be possible? You know, what, what can I do? And they said, yeah, that's great. What day are you flying in? So I left like the next day. And, um, and, and I was a little bit nervous too, because they were like, yeah, come on in. And they're like, also, if you want to wire us your donation, here's our bank account number. I was like, yeah, I'm going to not do that. Mm. <laughs> but I guess that's much more normal. I realized I was like, I'll, I'll give it to you when I get there. Mm. See if these people actually pick me up from the airport. And um, yeah, I went out and they helped me to get a, an apartment um, near the camp on the island while I was staying there. And I mean, the, the camp that I worked in is called Karatepa um, and it's on the same island also as Moria, which was, was, is now closed. Both of those are now closed, but the largest refugee camp in the world. Uh, and I thought, 
you know, I really, really didn't know what to expect. And, and a lot of people thought too, like, why would you want to do something that would be so sad, go to somewhere so depressing and like, oh, that sounds terrible. I, to date, it is the most, Karatepa refugee camp has been the most impactful thing in my life because it was the most inspiring, like beautiful, just like motivating and welcoming place that I have ever ever been on planet earth. And I've been to over 50 countries now. I think in that year alone, I went to like 110 cities. N nowhere even comes close. Seeing how this community was built inside the camp and every single person that was there just has a story of, well, I really want my kids to be able to go to school one day. So, you know, I've fought off. I've like just these crazy, amazing, inspiring stories of like survival, just, just to have like some kind of normalcy for themselves or for their children. I'm like, I don't know. I don't like every, to go to a place and say there's 1200 people that are here and every single one of them is a hero that has just overcome the odds because the people that don't, don't get out. Right. And it was, I was like, oh, your story is amazing. What you're doing is is beautiful. And if there is anything, whatever I can do to be a part of your journey to help you get there is my honor. Like I just I just want to be a part of it. And you know, you're doing all the you're all doing all the heavy lifting. What can I do to support you? So then going as um, so I, I did, I was for your tourist question, I was a volunteer. Um and I, you know, uh, immediately my my educator senses, my spidey senses kicked in, and uh, I ended up um, developing a English learning program, uh, some children's programs, and just kind of by like talking to people, you know, and seeing what it was like. What are, what are you guys missing? What do you want? What do you want to do? What are your goals? What are your interests? What are you doing right now during the day? And, uh, and everybody wanted to learn English. And there were quite a few organizations that were in the camp that already were teaching English and the classes were empty. They had like maybe one or two people show up. Like there's 1200 people here. Why are you, you wanna learn English? Here's English class. It's literally 10 steps from, you know, this con storage container that they have you sleeping in. Uh, and it was, m most of them just hadn't, uh, they had either, you know, really not much formal education because the war had been going on for so long where they came from, uh, or they it just had been so long since they were out of school that they were just so self-conscious to be in like formal education setting. And they would tell me like, I don't know enough English to go to English class. I'm like, and I mean, working in higher education, I've worked with adults and it, it is very different teaching children and teaching adults i was like yeah i get that you know we can't just like make you do it because you're a little kid right. <laughs> like you need you need that motivation factor and you need to feel comfortable people are a lot more self-conscious but i i always think it's really beautiful too because there's also something different about adults when they learn something new you just the look on their face you know that you're like you know how much this is going to impact your entire life you're going to go implement this in everything right now because you know what, how the world works. <laughs> you know exactly why you're learning this. And it's not because somebody else is telling you. It's because you've been in a position where you needed that skill and you didn't have it. So we just started this uh, informal uh, English class. We borrowed like some beanbag chairs and got some cookies at like the little quickie mart across the street and some chai, some chai tea, big hit. And, um, and we'd sit and I would pair one volunteer with one um, refugee. And I made all of these different little uh, educational materials and worksheets and stuff. And, uh, and I would say, okay, come in and I'll pair you up with a volunteer that will speak English with you. And you can talk about whatever you guys want. And if you don't know what to talk about, here's some materials about different kinds of subjects and you can choose what you want and you can you kind of use that as a starting place. But totally up to you guys, whatever you decide. Uh, and we had the first day, we had, I think four people show up, 
So I go around, kind of like advertise it a little bit, tell people about it, spread the word. Within two weeks, we had 60 people regularly show up. Wow. There were a lot of cookies and shy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so during these, I was like, oh, this is great. And, you know, uh, even though, so we had in that camp, we had 17 different nationalities represented just in refugees alone. Um, also, the volunteers are mostly like European. And so we had, and they're all from different non-English as the main language, you know, Germans and Spaniards and from all over. I was one of, I, at most of the time that I was there for the year, I was the only like native English speaker. I was the only American. Sometimes we had some Brits. Um, but, but English is the international language. So it didn't matter if we have someone that, you know, normally speaks Farsi from Afghanistan and someone from, you know, that speaks Spanish from Spain, if they want to communicate, they're communicating in English. So English was still the language that everybody's speaking, even though it was nobody's native language. So it really helped us to realize a lot of the refugees there, they didn't know what country they're going to go to in Europe. So they don't know what language they'll need for that. But wherever you go, English will be helpful. So as we set this up, uh, you know, we started like building that now we're talking with more people and building stronger relationships with the people in the camp and, you know, ask them, okay, what do you want? What's next for you? Where are you going? And uh, most of them had some kind of family or friends in Europe. And the biggest thing that they told us they wanted is they just wanted to get a job. They're like, I don't want a handout. I don't want somebody else to hand me a jacket. Like I want a job. I have family that's still back there. You know, they sent me, we only had enough to like, get one person out. They sent me to go and get everybody else out here. And, you know, I need to get a job so I can send money home so that I can take care of myself. And, you know, I don't, don't want to be here and then be getting these handouts. Uh, and so I was like, okay, well, what kind of job do you want to get? What kind of job experience do you have? And we saw like a really stark difference um, from, you know, the labor markets of the areas that they had been coming from to the labor markets of the areas they wanted to go. And this is before COVID. So at that point, over 90% of jobs need computer skills. Now we've had COVID, right? So it's like 99.999% of jobs, every, everything. You're like, just to have a friend, you need computer skills. Today. <laughs> and so uh, I was like, okay, well, let's, let's start working on your resume. And, um, brought my laptop out and realized that they did not know how to use the computers to make resumes. So, uh, so I, uh, was lent some laptops and one of my friends that was working for a different nonprofit lent me a couple of, uh, yoga mats and I used the hotspot on my phone and sat underneath the olives in the middle of camp. And I started teaching them how to use computers. Uh, we just kind of started with a with like a group from there, and the program just started becoming more and more structured. Eventually, the uh, director of the camp gave us our own like storage container called like ISO boxes to be our computer lab, um, and we were able to to make uh, formalized classes there, and like just grew more and more. Our classes were packed. We'd have people like waiting outside. For the classes and at first i noticed too they were mostly all men i had like a couple of women and then mostly men i was like oh well, i wonder you know if they're not interested or like what's like why that is i'd love to have also women coming to classes so i i had like i was teaching like four classes uh, a day and so i made one of them a women's only class full full so then i made another one a women's only class full and within two weeks, um, we actually were able to, then we said the other classes weren't men's only classes. It's just that women weren't going to them anyway. So mm -hmm. then we're like, oh, well you can also, you know, all these women are coming. You can't get into the women's only class. Like, would any of you guys feel comfortable coming to the other time? And they're like, yeah. So within two weeks, we actually had the classes, not just men's or women's, like they were mixed and then it was fine. And so it was such an eye-opening experience to me to realize it wasn't that they weren't interested. It's just that they didn't feel welcome until they had actually been invited, they, they didn't know that it was for them it, unless it was explicitly. And, it, and they had no problem being in the classes at that point.
And so um, that slowly grew. So I ended up staying there for a year. Um, and then my visa, my, my tourist visa ended. And uh, they were trying to hire me on actually, but um, we found out like three days before it expired that it was not going to be approved. So I, uh, I got kicked out of an entire country. I had to leave all of Europe and my apartment and my car, <laughs> came back to the US. And, um, and I actually found at that point, there was a program uh, in, in San Diego, uh, a master's in social innovation. I had, I had never heard of this term, but I, I started looking online. I was like, wow, I want to do more field humanitarian work. Like that was amazing. This is what I want to do with my life. And uh, as I'm looking, I see everything says like master's preferred. I'm like, all right, I'm not just competing against people in San Diego or just California. Like I'm competing against every person on the planet for this job. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to look at me without a master's. So uh, I started looking at what kind of master's would I want then and, um, and found the social innovation program, which basically uh, takes a look at different social innovation uh, issues around the world, global social issues, and helps to create a system so that you can create new innovative solutions to these problems. It's like, ah, oh, well, that's really similar to what I'd been doing. Cause in the first computer lab, I also had been teaching them how to do online jobs so they could start making money remotely wherever they went. Um, not realizing how helpful that would be once COVID did end up happening. Right. <laughs> so yeah, and so came out here. And then while I was um, back in San Diego, uh, only, a month and a half into my master's program in San Diego, 30 miles down the road is the US-Mexico border. And we started seeing thousands of migrants arriving, refugees arriving from Central America in caravans, in large groups uh, coming up seeking asylum at the US border. And it was like Europe all over again. It was the exact same issue different culture, different people, same problems and the same goals. So I thought, man, well, all right, I got kicked out of Europe, but like here, <laughs> I know, I know how to do this. I know, I know something about this. So I started volunteering um, while I was in school, went down to the border and started volunteering both in the migrant shelters. We were doing like kind of pop-up shelters, uh, emergency shelters in San Diego for all the people coming through. And then uh, also on the Mexico side, I had a professor, that I was working with. So we were starting to work with some families on the Mexico side. Um, and so I got to really, really like a keen and I'm studying it in class, right? And so I was taking like an immigration and asylum class and um, really got interested in like the legal aspect of it. And how does that work? And, you know, the similarities and the differences from like Europe and here and, you know, what have I learned from there that we can do here to like make it better and faster? And, uh, and, I would say during, so during this time is kind of when I came up the, with the idea for One Digital World. Um, I actually entered it, this concept uh, into a, a contest um, with my school, honestly, because they said, anybody that makes it through the first round gets 50 bucks. <laughs> I was like, I'm a broke college student. I'm writing a million papers. I'll, I'll send in like a first entrance and I, got accepted and I was like, oh, let's see. And I ended up, um, and so so I developed the program more and used that as my capstone. And I actually won the competition for my, my school level and I won uh, $4,500 in seed funding. Wow. And uh, I was contacted, that girl that had lent me the yoga mats for us to <laughs> sit on in our first computer classes, she was actually starting her own project on a different island out in Europe, uh, a women's shelter. And she said, hey, you did such a great job out in Lesbos. Would you come and do that for us out in Samos? And so I implemented uh, what I had created in grad school. So I used that seed funding and went back out to Samos and did that for four months. And we had over, uh, over 200 graduates in those four months from the program. Um, the program continued going all the way until COVID shut everything down, but continued going then for, you know, I, I came back and... September, so like another six months until that happened. And now that things are starting to open back up, we'll continue again. Um, but that was like our first iteration. So then I thought, okay, now I've got this pilot done. I know that it works. I know the system. I know uh, this is really close at home. So then I came back to, um, to San Diego and now I am currently working. We have operations in, we have 
uh, three different offices um, in migrant shelters in Mexico. Um, and we also are working with asylum seekers on the US side in Los Angeles um, and have plans to expand actually to, um, to two other countries before, uh, before the end of the year. Wow. That's so crazy. And, and I'm curious, maybe for people listening, uh, what does it look like? What is, what is a person who benefits from, uh, your, your classes and your courses? What does it look like for them? Like, is there a physical computer lab set up? Like, can you walk through a little bit of what that journey looks like of I'm entering your program and I'm graduating it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we do, we have, a couple of different programs going on. Um, our kind of flagship would be our digital literacy program. Uh, so in Mexico, uh, we work with different migrant shelters and we set up a lab on site. So they have one digital world lab inside of the shelter that is available to all asylum seekers staying in the shelter at that time. Um, uh, versus in Los Angeles, uh, we've, we don't have migrant shelters here. So they're actually staying in apartments. So they're remote learners. Uh, so they have laptops and they're signing on from home, which means sometimes we've got students that are like breastfeeding while they're taking class. You know, they've got like a 10 year old hanging off of them and like a four year old dancing in and out of the room while they're doing class, but uh, still taking their classes three nights a week to get through the program. Um, for what they learn, what I saw, um, you know, being because I was in Greece for so long that first year, I saw so many uh, students of mine that I got really close with were, you know, relocated and transferred out of the camp and into somewhere else in Europe, which is whatever we want for everyone and is so exciting and they're so happy. And then I would hear about a week later, they want to come back. Hmm. They're like, I, I miserable. I'm alone. I don't know anyone. I can't communicate with my uh, with my neighbors. I have no friends. I don't have anybody to talk to. I can't get a job. Nowhere will hire me. Um, I don't know how to get my kids registered in school. They're just sitting at home all day. They're, you know, trying to kick each other in the head, <laughs> just out of boredom. Um, you know, we're all stir crazy and we're hungry. And, you know, like, I don't want the handout, but I miss that community. Uh, and we actually sometimes did have people come back. They'd come back so that they then they'd work as translators in the camp mm. um, because they wouldn't be able to be there as refugees anymore. They would come back as jobs, though, because they missed it so much. That was actually pretty common. And so uh, I thought, gosh, really what we need to do, we need to tie together, not just teach them how to use a computer or how to do this online job, but we need to teach you these like life skills. What are all these things that I ha always use my phone for? you know, on the regular. So how do we prepare you to move into a new country and a new culture and use, you know, this tiny piece of technology or this laptop, be able to change your world. So uh, we teach things like as basic as, I mean, literally first starting off. So turning on the computer, how to use your keyboard and what the different keys are for, different operating systems, and then, you know, on a further level, how to use the internet, how to read websites, what the internet is, um, key websites that are really useful information, like how you can use the internet to sign up for um, different like resources. We actually had a student um, that was just telling me in class the other day that she, for the first time ever, she went on her computer and she signed up to pay her electric bill online. Mm -hmm. And she was so excited. She's like, I used what I learned in class. So I looked up, I, I thought maybe they have a website. So I looked it up and then I checked that it was a secure website. And then I created an account and put my uh, credit card information in and I signed up for paperless. And now I save $5 a day or $5 a month and I don't have to go down there anymore. And I'm like, yes, yes, this, like it's simple things. You know, and it's to her, it's, oh, that saves me. That saves me so much time. It saves me so much money. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and there's not a concern, you know, that now I'm going to be forgetting about it either. One less thing to worry about. Uh, we had another, um, another student that just told me about how she works in a travel agency. 
And so they always have her print out these spreadsheets. Uh, so she has to, uh, they give her a, a, a thumb drive and she goes and takes it to the printer and pays the printer. They go, they put the computer and everything, give it back to her and she takes it back, right? So uh, the other day she went in, she took the thumb drive and we had, she had learned about external devices and Bluetooth in class the night before. So she thought, oh, I know what this is. And so she went in, she went up to one of the computers, went through, printed it out herself and brought it back. And now she's saving her company money. She came back, you know how to do that. So, now, you know, this joy of being a bigger asset to her business, she's a better employee. Um, I have actually, when I, when I talked about um, the, that sometimes we have students that are like breast business, in particular um, that I have, and she she is always breastfeeding. She's got a little one in and out of the room and a young son that's likes to help with class, but he's certainly always there watching. You see him, his face like right here. And um, and she told us, she said, I, you know, I only went to school until third grade and I don't remember any of it, but now children. And they get to see me going to school now. And for the first time, I actually get to be a role model to my children and I tell them stay in school because mm -hmm. I didn't stay at school and look how hard it is for me now. It's going to be so easy for you, but I still have to know it. Mm -hmm. so, and that's so, so true. And we take for granted so many of these things, right? That we get to grow up learning how a computer interface works, like where to type in the thing, what to look for. I mean, all these really basic skills that many people just, don't have and have to be taught a different way when they become adults, right? Because like we've already, we're not kids and we, we learn differently and things like that. Um, I, I did have one question. So when you said that folks are, are taking some of these classes remotely, are they logging into sort of a platform? Is it on Zoom? Like what's the back end? I'm just curious, like what's the back end for that? Is there like a, like do you guys have a platform that's specific to the organization? We, act, we use Zoom. We use Zoom okay. and Google Classroom yeah. for our classes. And we do. So we have um, our digital literacy uh, classes and they learn, you know, search engines, email, um, how to find resources, sign your kid, register your kids for school, how to book a doctor's appointment online. Um, and then we have virtual ESL classes. Um, we are also a part of the Asylum Seeker Health Services Task Force. So helping asylum seekers get access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are also working with um, a few different partners um, to assist with immigration. So they can fill out their immigration paperwork online um, and it's like digitized and then we're coordinating and working with um, some different legal groups to help coordinate and get them access to pro bono lawyers to be able to take on their cases. So, so we really like, wanted to be, you know, like a, a holistic approach. These are all different things that you need when you're moving to a new place, legal support, healthcare, uh, language skills, computer, internet skills. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, you know, when you're, especially when you come to a new country, as a, let's say a refugee where presumably maybe you have fewer connections, fewer resources to kind of deal with, not everybody, of course, but many people, um, to have one place to go to for support, maybe direct support or connections to other support is really, really powerful. Cause you know, you, you I mean, from the, from the legal side of things, you get a, a lawyer's kind of business card or f WhatsApp phone number or whatever. And like, but that's just the legal side. What do you do after you get off the phone with the lawyer? You have to deal with, like you said, health and other things. And so it feel it sounds like one digital world is not just it, you're upskilling and you're 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 teaching folks of uh, really valuable kind of uh, skills, um, but then you're also providing them with additional downstream support, whether it's directly or sort of indirectly. Um, and and are, is one digital world a nonprofit, right? We are. Yeah, we're a five hundred one c three. Nice. Um, and so uh, for anybody listening or watching, they can also, can they donate to the organization, support what you're doing uh, directly Absolutely. through your website or how can they do that? Yeah. Our website is www.onedigitalworld.net. Uh, and they can do donate directly on the website. We have like a monthly giving platform. You can also sponsor students or sponsor classes uh, and you know, that money goes, goes straight towards our programs. 
uh, we get to see the transformation. We actually have students, uh, we actually have a class graduating tonight. Uh, oh, so wow. I'll, be, uh, I'll be putting my blazer on for that. We just, myself and the other instructors side, we're gonna put on our blazers and uh, have our little One Digital World hearts here and be celebrating. Um, and they'll be getting their certificates when they do the digital literacy class. Uh, they actually also get their earning certificates from Microsoft in digital literacy and building their resume. Wow. So they're gonna be having, they're gonna finish up their resume tonight. They'll be awarded all of their certificates. Um, and it's all a part of like building this portfolio, you know, building, getting you ready for the next, the next stages to be successful and self-reliant uh, in the US. That's incredible. Do you have, and so looking forward, do you have plans to um, expand this type of service abroad? I mean, I know you're doing English skills, but to your earlier point, English is very often a language that's used around the world. Um, you know, websites are the same, you know, they tend to be like signing up for auto pay for your bank, it's probably similar here, you know, and as well, you know, to and like in Europe or something like that. Do you have plans to expand this in other places? And like, how would that even, how would that work? Um, do you need people on the ground? Can you, is it just a matter of marketing and, and you, what you're, what you've built already here is enough to support other countries? I don't know, where are you looking ahead to? Absolutely, it's actually, uh, we're able to do everything completely remote at this point. We also, we do do groundwork because we do set up labs um, where the labs don't exist and like we've done in Mexico, but we're already right now working with students in the US and in Mexico. And um, we are looking to, and, and have done that in Greece. So we are looking to continue expanding both domestically within the US to other areas as well as abroad and beginning in, uh, into more and more countries. So we're actually talking with a couple of different uh, camps and organizations in Africa and in South America right now. So we'll look to be there soon, but we're able to do, yeah, to go on the ground and actually set up labs where those need to be set up and where people already have access to computers and the internet, we're ready to go. We already are able to provide all of that information uh, completely remotely. Wow. And our team is actually, we've got about 20 people on the team and we're all over the world. We've got an instructor in Colombia. We've got a grant writer out in Denmark. We've got uh, our communications manager lives in Norway. So we're, we're all ready everywhere. <laughs> wow, that's, that's really cool. And it's perfect for this you know, work from anywhere environment we're in now because that means people can work with you and support the organization without having to be in San Diego physically or, or what have you. Something um, that's really beautiful that happened too with uh, with our group that's in Los Angeles, they've never met uh, because of COVID and they didn't realize and our instructor for that class is in Missouri. And she was saying, oh, in California, you know, this is how you get your, your uh, health insurance. These are the doctor's offices you can go to. Like, this is the website. This is how you check it and use it. And they're like, wait, where are you? What do you mean in California? <laughs> and she's like, oh, I'm in, I'm in Missouri. So they have a group WhatsApp so they all started messaging and realizing that they're all neighbors. They're like, oh, oh. I'm over by this freeway. Oh, I'm on this street. Oh, I live over here. And they're like, wow, I've lived here for two, three years and I've never known anyone. And they were like, well, if you need anything, like blessings to you and your family, I'm very close. And they were all messaging. So I think they're actually getting together tonight. They're like, we want to get together for graduation. We don't, we don't know anyone. So wow. now building this, actually just organically building this community with each other. If someone that's, you know, going through a really similar experience and being, you know, continuing to be able to build these relationships, so they can share these resources long after classes are done. That's so cool. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that some of these folks, their relationships with one another will last a lifetime, if not, you know, at least for many, many years. Um, I wanted to just go through a few comments that we got. Some of them date back a little bit to your story, <laughs> um, but Marianne, a couple of comments here talking about beach, uh, and and uh, flip flops and um, working with Vietnamese refugees in the Philippines, um, so that that's really cool. And then Love girl that. power about you going on, going on your trip. Um, yeah. Here is his amazing story and story. Your resilience is incredible. Um, thank you for for that comment. Um, uh, we, uh, Marianne said, "Isn't it amazing how clown cars can hold such large people uh, if if they are if they are." willing to crouch and then she loves your gumption and initiative um and that the refugees would love you and then uh steven here mentions have you read the book how to change the world by david bornstein and it's full of amazing stories so maybe that's one to add mm. to the 
to the reading list, you know? Summer reading time. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've This person, uh, I don't know who, who this is. We can't tell because of private privacy settings on their account, but terrific enthusiasm. Stick with it. Um, so thank you for, thank for you. that. Um, and then if Marianne says, oh, my God, Samo spent a month on the island doing a photography project. Man, I, I didn't know that. You know, Marianne and I have talked many times, you know, like the things you learn about your network in, in various instances is so cool. Thank you for all your comments, Marianne. Um, so, Casey, I wanted to, I kind of want to be conscious of your time, of course, too. Um, you you kind of talked about where you're you're going and you're growing uh, and you're working on potentially expanding to other countries and all these um, other initiatives. Uh, from a taking a step back though, and looking at it from like a more global perspective, what are you seeing? Like, I mean, it's hard to know because, especially with ref with a refugee type of crisis when there is one, it often comes out of you know it, it doesn't come off of like a trend that we can see based on the more the market's moving. It's like if there's a civil. Un, if there's civil unrest, if there is um, uh, a, a, a like an, a natural geological or sort of weather event that just like devastates an area, and that creates something that you know displaces people, and we can't we can't project that. We just have to have some infrastructure ready. So I usually like to ask guests like, oh, where do you see the industry going? Right, like you know, but in terms of immigration technology. But I think from your perspective, it's a little bit different because it's it's somewhat more um, uh, inconsistent, I guess. But what are your thoughts about sort of the higher, you know, do you, do you have thoughts about sort of climate change and the displacement of people? Like, where do you see potentially the future for better or worse of this type of displacement of persons and sort of what can we all do to think about it or to help or, or whatever? Yeah, great question. Um, in fact, Right now, you know, in our, our Mexico sites, a lot of people that we're seeing are from Guatemala and Guatemala was hit um, last year by two major, major hurricanes in, within a six month period that just devastated entire towns. And a lot of a lot of the refugees that we we're seeing along the border come from there. And climate change is definitely uh, definitely a major precursor to this. So certainly things that, you know, Civil war, okay, that's another country that that might be more difficult for us to really have much of an effect on. Um, but I think a lot of it is uh, like educating yourself, um, taking better care of you know this this planet. We've only got one; it's the only one with chocolate. I like to say, take care <laughs> of it. <laughs> um, and you know. It's funny because I have one of those jobs that I'm kind of hoping that one day I won't have the job anymore. Just kind of try and like work myself out of the job, right? I hope yeah. that one day there will no not be any more refugees. Um, but right now we have the largest forcibly displaced uh, numbers of people in recorded history, more than World War II. Last year, that was the biggest. The year before that, that was the biggest. But we keep increasing these numbers they're not decreasing so i think the things that we can control is that we can you know educate ourselves and each other about like why are these things happening why are people moving and relocating and what opportunities do they have because we really see a big benefit you know there's plenty of deficiencies even in the us we have certain labor markets that we are not that competitive in on a global scale, you know, and bringing people in from different parts of the world is such an asset. We bring in new perspectives. I mean, the we have we see also cities that have higher uh, concentration of immigrants have lower crime rates. We see that there's um, like entrep or that immigrants are more likely to be entrepreneurs, which creates more jobs which also creates more um, tax revenue and more money to go back into the economy. So there's so many benefits. There's so many benefits of whatever type of status that an immigration comes that they are bringing to this new community. So being able to kind of change that mindset and be able to educate about, okay, why is this happening? And where are we at right now? Fortunately for One Digital World, you know, COVID has been really difficult on everybody 
But for us, it actually, you know, it allowed us to kind of be that that middleman. So there's so many resources that already exist. There's so many people doing so many amazing things to help other people, but they can't access them. One digital world, we virtually facilitate different, like different um, focus groups, different organizations. Like we help get what it is that you want to give to people and the people that need it. And so we can, we are that link in the chain to be able to bring that all together. So I think if anything, this last year has just brought us to be able to realize that the world's not as big as we used to think it was. It's really not. You know, we send an email. How many Facebook friends do you have that are from all over now? So we are connected wherever we go. So just being able to kind of change that mentality and think about what are our assets that we want to bring to build a better future for everyone. I love it. Amen. I, I agree 100 percent, especially, you know, you, when we do think about how many people we've been able to connect with via technology from around the world. It's like, well, we have to care for the world in the same way that we benefit from getting food from around the world and being able to travel on vacation from around the world and being able to have friends and pen pals from around the world. We got to care, care for the world too, both its people and the trees, the, the, the cacao plants and, and all, <laughs> all the um, chocolate, all the chocolate. We can, what are, what are we going to do without chocolate? Except the dogs will be happy because now the threat's gone. Um, awesome. No, I, I, yeah, I, I totally, uh, I, I love that. Um, just two more comments. We Heather mentioned that Honduras also had flooding. Um, Marianne said, love the shows. Kudos to you and your amazing guests. And, and thank you, Casey, of course, um, for being one of those amazing guests. Um, and then Stephen says applause for the benefits uh, of immigration collaboration across the globe. Um, so Casey, I think we talked about this, but people can, f uh, for folks who are interested in learning more, uh, they can visit you at www.onedigitalworld.net. Correct. Um, and right. we are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, we have a newsletter, subscribe. We have, it's our, our weekly blog, which is always giving updates about different border issues, different initiatives. We work with a lot of many, many partners, which I, I, I should name drop, but there's too many to go on to list. So please check out our website, um, follow us, subscribe to our newsletter. We have lots of really great information and try and synthesize that, you know, from this, uh, this, this techie and immigration talk down to layman's terms so that we all know what's going on. We can figure this out, this whole, whole big world together. Absolutely. Um, so you heard it here, folks. Please check them out. Um, share the website with, with others. Sign up. Um, follow the work that Casey and uh, One Digital World are doing. Um, Casey, thank you so much. This was really just an inspiring and exciting and amazing conversation. Your journey was crazy. Very happy that you made it out of Brazil safely and alive um, because that was just, that sounds like it was a wild time. Um, but, you know, everything that, whatever doesn't kill us, make us makes us stronger, they say. And I suppose this was one of those uh, moments. So, yeah, Casey, thank you so much. This was really great to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. This was amazing. I could talk all day. We'll do, we'll do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for everybody listening too. Yes. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here and um, for listening, for all your comments. Wow, what a crazy story. Check out, connect with Casey on LinkedIn um, if or wherever, wherever you are. Um, definitely check out their website. And if you can, donate and support them, of course, or otherwise sign up for their newsletters, et cetera. Um, I'm actually taking off next week for the show, uh, and I will... Maybe I'll do some kind of a live, maybe a Q and A or something, but no guests next week, giving myself uh, the the week off and and you all. Um, but as always, thank you for for being here, for supporting this this show, all these conversations. Um, I learn a lot. I hope you all learn a lot. Uh, and um, there's just so many people doing amazing things for others in the industry, whether it's business immigration, family immigration, refugee and asylum. There's just so much to do. So it's really inspiring to have these talks every week. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Peace out and stay safe.